Hi, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome once again to uh, Computer Sound and Music. Today we are going to talk a little bit about advanced synthesis, and I probably should use a lot of air quotes with that. Synthesis is a really complicated topic that people devote their whole careers to, but what I'm going to do is just move a little bit today beyond sort of 60s style generative synthesis and 80s style sampling synthesis and talk about some of the things you might do in a more modern kind of synthesizer to make interesting noises. I hope everybody's doing well out there. Let's go ahead and get started. So, long window. So, the first place we're going to start is with FM synthesis, which is a really, really nice technique for synthesizing really complex sounds without a ton of complexity or resources in the synthesizer. It's been used really extensively with digital synthesizers because it's really easy to build a high quality digital FM synthesizer out of not very much. So here's the idea. Imagine that I've got a, a LFO, a low frequency oscillator, and I'm going to provide use that oscillator to provide vibrato. So I'm going to vary the frequency a little bit over time. And so the way that looks sort of schematically is I'm going to uh, sort of take the fundamental frequency and then I'm going to add, I'm going to waver time a little bit by taking this LFO and feeding it in as part of the argument to the time thing of the sinusoid. And so as it moves left and right, sort of it, it's going to induce a wobble in the frequency of the thing. And that's going to give me a vibrato sound. It's going to, and that's cool. And that was one of the first things that people built into old school synths. But then, of course, you do what you do when you're a musician and have a new toy. You start playing with the knobs. And if you're an engineer, you have a new toy, you start playing with the knobs. And in this case, the interesting question was, well, what if our low frequency oscillator is driven at a much higher frequency than you normally would to get vibrato? What if I turn it up above 100 hertz? What if I turn it up above 500 hertz? And when I do that, it turns out that what I get is a signal with a rich set of harmonics and subharmonics with the fundamental frequency. So the there's a trig identity here that says that I'm going to get a bunch of multiples of the fundamental sinusoid at various harmonic levels. And that's also exactly how an FM radio works. Uh, we use an audio signal to make vibrato on a radio signal. And if you over-modulate FM, then you splatter all over the band and the FCC and your neighbors get really mad at you. Well, here we're gonna splatter all over the band on purpose. So if you look at this uh, Wikipedia article on frequency modulation, you'll see that it, uh, you know, makes some really, really interesting waveforms. We take, and this is too small to see, we take a, uh, I just find, oh, nice. Uh, excuse me a moment while we fix all the things. No, I don't know how to do that. All right, anyway, you can see that we have a, a low frequency oscillator as a modulator. We might have an envelope generator on that sometimes. We go ahead and use that along with a depth control to say how much we're amplifying the, the um, thing, and then we're going to feed that as a control to the frequency of this oscillator, a frequency controlled oscillator, and there we go. And the waveforms we get out look pretty neat. There's a, you start with the sinusoid when you have a very low frequency and that's got a little vibrato in it even though you can't see it. You start to turn things up and well, things get really interesting. And eventually we get to a situation where we really are generating many, many harmonics. And these sounds are really kind of interesting and beautiful. And if you want to play with our FM synthesizer in Python, that's essentially a single FM unit synthesizer. It's got a single LFO that modulates the fundamental frequency. And it's awfully a lot of fun. Uh, 
so the classic one of these is the Yamaha DX7, and you've all heard DX7 sounds before, I'm pretty sure. Uh, the DX7 has a flow graph of lots of operators, because of course the next natural question, once you've decided to overdrive, you know, drive the LFO at high frequency to get interesting sounds, and I'm failing to find this diagram here, but in here somewhere is a description of the flow graph of, well, what if we drive the operators other ways? What if we go ahead and, you know, make complicated combinations of things with each other? We can do modulator and carrier, and eventually you can build these very fancy flow graphs where this one is modulating, this one is modulating, this one is modulating, this one. It can be really, really fancy. And so that can produce some a whole range of real interesting sounds, including some fairly natural sounds just by using FM. Another approach is granular synthesis. I haven't played with granular synthesis so much. I've only really mostly read about it, but it's an interesting idea. And granular synthesis starts with the jealousness of audio people over about graphics people. Graphics people have their whole own set of adventures and are kind of troubled. But one of the nice things about graphics is that because the eye, well, it really is a frequency domain device just like the ear, but at small enough resolution that you can mostly treat it like a spatial domain device. And so you get pixels, and pixels are awesome. And the switch from raster graphics from vector graphics where you had to draw lines, excuse me, to raster graphics was a big time. I was around for it really. And in the history of graphics and everybody got excited about pixels. There's no audio equivalent of pixels. Because the ear is such a frequency domain device, I can't sort of say, well, I will have, you know, a, a sort of a sound pixel and I will make sounds by painting sound pixels onto the real line or uh, can you and so that was the granular synthesis question if we the problem here is frequency uncertainty uh the uncertainty principle for frequencies if i make my pixels too small it isn't like the it isn't so much like the situation with graphics where I can build them up in some obvious way. I, if I make them too small, it isn't even obvious what frequency they are anymore. If I make them too big, then I sort of can hear the transitions between them. But that's the idea of granules, is that they're a sort of sound pixel. And we pick a duration sort of in the one to 50 millisecond range, long enough that tones will be heard as tones, but too short to hear individual notes, hopefully. Uh, and so we break up. A sample into overlapping chunks that are sort of sound pixels that more or less describe the wave that we're interested in and then you can do things with these sound pixels that sort of correspond to things you could do to transform a graphical image you can hit shift to resample the individual granules you can time stretch by replicating or emitting granules you can get fun synthesis effects like emitting randomly sampled granules from some frequency range, that kind of stuff can make some really interesting and pretty noises. Uh, the thing about granular synths that I've heard is they sound pretty distinctive. You're not going to mistake them for anything else. And distinctive sounds are cool, but you probably can't use it for everything, at least from what I've seen. Uh, there's some links to that. The next one is something I've sort of hinted at before, the idea of physical modeling. I really a lot of times want to model natural instruments or other natural sounds. And, you know, there's all kinds of games I can play with trying to find settings on my FM synthesizer or some flow graph for my generative synthesizer or whatever. I can, you know, try to just sample the real thing, but that can be difficult and doesn't cover all the cases. So maybe what I need to do is literally just build a, a software model of the instrument itself and run the model to get the simulated sound of the instrument. And that's super hard. It requires massive computational resources, probably more than anything else in synthesis. And 
it requires some pretty sophisticated physics a lot of times for physical devices or at least electronics analysis for old elect or analog devices but you can get some pretty neat results that are hard to get with sampling or with these sort of kludgy approaches you can get so some years ago my friend keith and i were building a midi sampling synthesizer and we needed samples and we didn't have a great source of samples this was way before there was any such thing as open sound fonts and so keith took a microphone and sampled a bunch of instruments and they all sounded pretty good the one that didn't sound good is the one that always doesn't sound good the harpsichord sounded terrible and the harpsichord sounded terrible for an interesting reason, because he did literally sample every one of the however many keys that harpsichord has and use an individual sample for each of them, so it should have been perfect. But here's the thing. The case of a harpsichord is really, really super resonant, and it's really, really super resonant at fixed frequencies. So first of all, you couldn't shift the pitches much at all if any, because you'd shift the case resonance frequency along with the pitches, because it was basically unavoidable, and now the instrument just sounded terrible. So now you do get your full set of samples, well, great, but now the case is supposed to be resonating with all the pitches at once. That's a really, you know, it isn't the same to play a bunch of copy samples with the pitch resonating to that single key, and so it all kind of fell apart, and the harpsichord never sounded good, but that's, one of the fundamental rules of synthesis is that harpsichord synthesizers never sound good, so we didn't feel too bad. On the other hand, Keith now has a pipe organ simulator that is just amazing. He's got the full rank manual keyboard, and he's got some software by a company called Hoptwork, which mostly is sampling. They went around to the famous pipe organs of the world and essentially sampled every pipe in the pipe organ, which was kind of expensive. It was cool, but then these same kinds of problems apply, right? I still am gonna need room effects and stuff, but more importantly, a pipe organ is a really physical instrument. So things like the volume of air in the wind chest really, really matter. If I hold down a key for a long time, you'll empty the wind chest faster than whatever is pumping it can fill it, and I'll lose pressure somewhat in the organ, and I need to model that sag and stuff. So Hoptworks synthesizer is an amazing combination of some physical modeling of how the organ works, how are the keys coupled to the pipes, how do the stops work, with uh, sampling. And you know, to my untrained ear, it sounds pretty much like a pot pipe organ with a pair of terrible, even with a pair of terrible speakers mounted on the wall. The piano synthesis modeling synthesis world has actually gotten really good in the last five years or so. This is something where more CPU power turned out to be really, really beneficial. Pianos are hard because each key hits three different strings, which are coupled through the bridge and also coupled to all the other strings on the piano through the bridge, but very closely coupled to its two neighbors. And the bridge is super resonant, and so, and the felting matters and stuff. So there's a lot to model to do a good pure physical model of the piano. And yet, there's some pianos out there now that are physically modeled that sound pretty samplery. So that's pretty cool. Like I've mentioned before, Modeling a plucked string is kind of awful. You can model the sustain part of it, like with violin pads, really, really well. But modeling the actual initial plucking and the, the attack decay, essentially, of that is really, really hard. There's a thing called Carplus Strong, which is sort of a differential equation used to, uh, to model this physically and what it basically is is a model of sort of what happens it's a it's a noise and then filter model because you can treat the initial impulse of your piano of your guitar pluck or whatever as sort of a noise burst and then you can filter it and you run that cyclically after time 
and that gives you some kind of a sim simulation of the thing and it's not that great and it's a pain to implement but it's kind of where we are I mean really at the end of the day if you really want to model an instrument you have to do acoustics. There's a whole discipline of physical acoustics with conferences and everything. And you end up writing down some really hard math and some doing some really hard physics and some really hard computation to try to actually simulate the operation of the instrument accurately enough that you can get realistic sounds out of it. And drums right now are a very active area of research. People are really interested in the physics of drum heads and how to model that, and the physics of drum resonators and how to model that. Last thing I wanted to talk about, and then we'll call it good, is a little bit about the architecture of synthesizers, because this is an area that's kind of interesting and isn't talked about as much as a lot of the other things. So now you've got, over the last couple of weeks, a whole bunch of ways to make sounds for a synthesizer. But the question is, how do we glue them together? And I wanted to talk a little bit about it, because I talked a little bit about it with my fun MIDI synthesizer, and it is an interesting thing so I'm getting ready to put our synthesizer able to be able to do flow graphs and so things are interesting so the first the real fundamental problem with architecting a synth is that we have a fundamentally asynchronous problem just like any other kind of UI problem we have the musician who is operating asynchronously from us they push the key when they want to push the key they turn the knob when they want to turn the knob and we have no control over it and we have the sound card, which is trying to pump samples somewhere as fast as, you know, as fast as we told it to. And in between, we have to match all that up. When the musician presses a note, they expect to get that note out the sound card with really low latency. The sound card expects that the samples we give it will keep appearing fast enough that it never runs out, underruns are bad. And so how do we sort of split the processing up so all those things happen at the same time? And, you know, why is this hard? Well, because concurrency or parallelism is pretty much implied at this point, and that's generally an inefficient way to go. Also, because we really do have these hard real-time requirements. If we underrun or if we lag too much on the musician, it's pretty much a failure of the synthesizer. So the usual plan is to use as few, two th few threads as possible, which is probably two. And what, by threads here, I don't necessarily mean literally POSIX threads, some kind of two flows of control, right? One flow of control has to be reading what the musician does. Another flow of control has to be providing samples. And then, but then we have this third task that sits awkwardly in the middle of actually taking the input of, from the musician and translating it into samples. And in terms of the computational effort, that's the bulk of this, right? The synthesizer really is mostly a synthesizer. It's not mostly a keyboard processor or a sample generator. And so we need to make some split if we're only going to use two threads of control somewhere in the middle. And the question is where and how to do that. And the model I recommend, because it's the one I use mostly and is easy to start out with, is what I call the pull model. Uh, when a sample's needed, then the audio output stuff knows it's needed, so it calls a sample mixer, and the sample mixer calls sample generators, and the sample generators call each other somehow, so we there's some f complex flow graph to implement, and we're gonna essentially, and this is why I call it a pull model, take them end to front, right? The audio output stuff asks for a sample, the thing that's generating that sample, usually some kind of mixer, asks its upstream generators they ask their upstream generators if there's for example an lfo or some other kind of thing there may be envelope generators stuck in here somewhere and so we execute this graph output to input until we hit the sources and the sources in the flow graph are going to be a set of currently playing notes and i tend to just store those as a set or a list or an array of some kind and you know, you could represent them either as some set of input parameters from the keyboard, or you could generate sample buffers for the note as you start the note. There are advantages both ways. There are also another 
set of sources in the flow graph are a set of control values because I need to take into account the current setting of the volume knob and the pitch wheel and whatever else I need to do. And the flow control for these notes, I can't just have them sit around forever. I can't just pile up notes forever. And so when a note is completely played out, when its, when it's release phase has reached low enough that nobody can hear the note anymore, then it's usually the output code that throws it out of the note set and says, okay, this note's played out, I will throw it. And when a key is pressed, well, the keyboard just adds a note to the note set, denoting that the key has been pressed. So that's what you do in response to a MIDI off me on message, and that's in the other thread. That part's in the input thread. When a key is released, then you've got to dig through the note list, the note set, and try to find the note that was generated and you need to mark it somehow as a note that's now releasing because otherwise you won't get a natural release. And finally, when the MIDI stuff notices the control has changed, it needs to update the control value somehow so the output side can find that when it's executed. And that pull model is kind of complicated, but it feels to me like most of the other models I've seen lying around are more complicated than that. And it does have the advantage of being sort of sample generation gets priority, which is great because underruns are sort of the worst thing that can happen to you as a musician. You really don't want to have a click or skip in the middle of what you're playing. And further, as we've discovered, a lot of audio libraries already want to do callbacks. So when they need samples, they'll call some function. Well, that's a natural place to start this lazy evaluation of the flow graph. And if you do it right, when um, somebody presses a new key or somebody turns a control, you don't have to do too much going back through the already playing stuff to figure out what to do. You could, in fact, completely reinitialize the notes all at the point that they're at, and then the next time the output stuff comes through, off we go. Now, the bad news, first of all, since we're using two threads, we're gonna have to have some synchronization. So every control value is probably gonna have to be locked. Every sample buffer access is probably gonna have to be locked. Um, by sample buffer here, I mean the note buffer, the list of notes. That's a reasonably small bottleneck, but you've gotta watch out for it. In particular, fairness becomes pretty hard. You may, in the worst case, because the output samples have priority, the musician may end up locked out of the instrument. They want to play notes, but the latency is effectively infinity because the synthesizer is full right now. Thank you very much. That's a really unpleasant situation. Is it better to ignore the next key press or is it better to underrun? Who knows? Ideally, you have enough slack that neither of these happen. It's not a And finally, you know, laziness is kind of expensive. If you're working in C in particular, you don't really have any great way to do this sort of lazy evaluation of this graph except to hardwire together all the calls to the upstream generators and stuff. And you don't want to do that because you want to be able to configure the instrument on the fly. So now you're doing things like storing flow graphs and walking them and stuff. But still, all in all, it's a pretty decent way to uh, sort of bolt your synthesizer together so that you can get it up and running quickly and still have it scale out to doing more. That's what I've got for you today. I hope it was useful. I uh, Next time we'll begin our, our discussion of music theory. It'll be the first couple of music, music weeks. But for now, I hope you're all doing well once again, and I will talk to you again soon. Thanks for listening.